Wait a little bit, Tony. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Tony, thanks. We are now live and streaming, and uh, you will you can start, and I will uh, turn the the computer that you can see uh, the space and. Uh, okay. Should we do that now? We have problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Now the technical problems are solved. Very okay. Good. Four people. How good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> That's so good. I was, I gave a lecture in Berlin and the audience was so small, I could shake everyone's hand before the lecture. It was very charming. But I can't do that now because you're a thousand miles away. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and give you a lecture. Is that visible, everybody? Can you see the lecture? I oh, know. Can you can you see the lecture? Oh, okay. This might be a problem. That's interesting. Good. I'll begin. Um, I'll, I will talk about how the buildings that we design, I design, have relationships to the world around them. And I would say emotional relationships to the people that use them. And the first project is the art museum, the Fulsang Art Museum in Denmark, which is about two and a half hours south of Copenhagen. It's in Eastern Denmark, in the countryside. And to come to it, you, you can only- Tony? Yes, Tony? yes. We can't, we can't see the slides or the, the, uh, the pictures. Okay, hold on a second. Let me just um, start again. Sorry, Arno, I'm making a mess of this, but I'll get there. Um, right, hold on. Can you see that? Yes. You can? Yes. Okay, I'll start again. Okay, so the, the lecture is about how the buildings that I design and we design in the office have relationships, conscious relationships to the, to the world around them, but also conscious relationships with the people that use them. And the, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. The first building is in, um, uh, Denmark uh, in a place called Fulsang, which is in the countryside. And it's a museum for a public collection of art that is from the mid 18th century to the mid 20th century. So it's a mixed collection 
in all the different styles of European painting. And then there's a program of um, temporary exhibitions, uh, which we provide for. And the collection also has um, plaster sculptures. So it's, it's two and a half hours away from Copenhagen. And you can only get there by car. You go through this countryside, very, very flat countryside of farms and agricultural land. And then you arrive on foot, in fact, in, in this space here. You park your car out of sight of the museum and then you walk to the museum. And opposite the museum is this manor house um, and a, a very beautiful agricultural barn with a, a low white wall and a huge roof. And these two buildings had an influence on the design that I made for the gallery. Inside the um, manor house, it, the interiors have been made over a long period of time. So they're all different. They're all slightly different. The floors are all different. The ceilings are all different. And I found that very stimulating, that there was a, a classical um, uh, uh, design um, philosophy, so to speak, but which could allow um, casual, almost casual differences. And that was, became part of the way that we designed the interior of the museum. Now, this is a photograph of the location before we made the building. And the competition, it was a competition, the rules of the competition suggested that we would build a building here to close the courtyard. And we looked at the view, which is beautiful, which is very, very flat across fields to the sea. And we didn't want to enclose that view. So we put the building here. And you'll see on this model that that's the manor house. And that's where we put the building. And as I said, the competition suggested the building would go here, but we put it here. So it's, it's in the fields amongst these other buildings. And when you come from this point, parking your car in that field, when you come from this point, the first thing you see is the landscape with our building at the side. And you see a flat facade, which is the same length as the manor house facade. And it has these three zenithals, these three roof lights, as we say in English, that light the calories. And they're turned, they're at an angle. So as you walk closer, the entrance takes you away from that view. And there's a, I'll show you, when you come inside, there's a cafe here. And then at the back of, on the side of the cafe, there's a view through this room, this room which is for public art lectures. They teach people to paint. They teach schools, so it's very charming. And at the back of there, there's a view. There's an apple orchard. So when you arrive, you, you, you travel to the landscape. Then you see the landscape framed by the building, and it goes away. And then you come inside, and you find you see another part of the ground. And then when you go into the museum, in the distance, you see the view of the landscape framed again. And the galleries are arranged around this central gallery. And here is a, a room for temporary exhibitions. And on the other side, much smaller rooms for um, classical painting. And this is the the room for temporary exhibitions. And it has, um, has a ceiling, which the light comes through this ceiling. It's a metal 
metal grid. And you can change the light from light to dark. You can see here that this is dark. So you can have one end of the gallery can be for painting and the other can be for video and film, or it can be for this kind of installation. And further along on this side, there's another type of daylighting, which is just roof lights showing you the sky. And so you get a sort of connected series of rooms with different lighting. And as we go through, I'll point out that the floor changes. Here it's in lines. In other places, it's in a chevron pattern like this. So on the other side of that, that main central gallery are these rooms. And they have a, this element in the ceiling is the zenitors that we saw on the outside of the building. And these rooms were for their collection of small um, paintings, which in Denmark are called the paintings of the golden age. And we made a, a gold ceiling and a decorated ceiling that could absorb the lighting track. And these rooms are collected, connected en filade, as they say in French. And the purpose here, and this was the client's desire, the purpose is that visitors can have several different ways of going through the gallery. So, for example, if you're a a single person who's come to look at a painting, a specific painting, and you don't want to meet a group of visitors who are being taken around the gallery and spoken to, you can escape. There are several different ways through this gallery. And it means that the people who come to this place, and they come from quite far away, um, have a sense of a circuit in the, in the museum. So instead of um, in some museums where you go to the end and you come back, here you go all the way around and you discover things. And each time you come, you can go in a different direction. This zenith or roof light puts light on the floor, but it doesn't put light on the walls because these paintings, they need 50 lux of lighting which you can do best with electric lighting. But the light on the floor, which changes according to daylight, makes the space seem as though it's lit by daylight. So you get, in the periphery of your eye, you get the changing light on the floor, which counteracts the, the um, constant light on the paintings. Now, at the end of this range of galleries, there's this space, which is for, <coughs> excuse me, for sculpture, which doesn't have um, light control problems. It doesn't have conservation problems. So there's a very large window here to the um, surroundings. So you rediscover the surroundings again. But then if you go back into, um, the central corridor and walk downward, there's a room which is just for looking at the landscape. <clears throat> and this was another idea of the client. The program for this building was very beautifully constructed. The client group had spent a year writing their program and they had engaged a local architect to make a scheme for each of their thoughts on the program. So they could see what it would be like to build their program. And they changed their program little by little. And then they had a competition. So it was a, a wonderfully organized um, 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 competition, the best one I've ever been in. And the director of the museum, Anne Hoyer Peterson, is a woman, and I, I found that all of the best clients in museums are, are, are women directors who have a completely different attitude to, to men. You know, they have an attitude of um, 
serving the community, of being um, uh, empirical. So I, I just say this, that I, I've worked at least four times with great um, women uh, directors of art museums. Um, if we look from the outside now, that's the room I just showed you. And this is the window to the sculpture gallery. And what we can see is, sorry, that, that this building has a, a relationship to the, the white barn. And we might think that, that abstraction like this was created in, in the early 20th century in the modern movement, but it wasn't. Abstraction has been part of vernacular architecture where somebody makes a barn, somebody copies it and changes it and refines it, and it happens again and again and again, and you get abstraction, reduction. And the building is happy in the fields. It's not a building which, although it's urbane, you might say, it can exist in the landscape. And here we see that that small room for looking at the landscape talks to one of these buildings out in the field. And this happens very frequently in the buildings that we design. They unconsciously, they end up having relationships with parts of the surroundings that we noticed rather than seeing. In um, Dainsen, Belgium, we made a town hall, um, a rather interesting project, which, um, which consists of a large office building for um, where people work. And at the ground floor, a place where the public comes to discuss um, financial things. And then on the front, there's a council chamber, the place where the politicians sit to make decisions for the city. And both of these elements have a loggia in front of them, which shades the building from the sun. And so it's a low energy building. It's, it's naturally ventilated. It uses um, heat from the earth. And these loggias also have another social purpose as I'll show. But this building in a strange way talks to the church. Whether they understand each other, I don't know. But also it talks to these less interesting buildings which are also part of the fabric of the city. If you see that the formalisms in our building are harmonious with the buildings around it. And it's made from stone and concrete, which are very uh, classic Flemish materials. And you can see here, that this is a stone from Milan, from which um, you will find quite often in Milan. And the Irish practice, graft and architects used it on their um, university building there. So it's very vigorous, curiously like concrete. And as I say, each of these buildings has a loggia. And you could imagine that on this loggia, on the council chamber, that people would come out and smoke a cigarette and have a discussion, or when the council chamber is used for weddings, for wedding ceremonies, people get married there, the guests could come out and look at the landscape. And, and part of it, it's the place where they eat lunch. This is an important thing in Flanders. People bring food and they heat it up in the kitchen inside and then they eat outside. So 
those people who are indoors all day have an opportunity to come out and in fine weather they can eat looking at the river. But also in the workplaces, in the offices, there's a door which lets you out to this closure. So you could make a mobile phone call from the balcony or smoke a cigarette. You could sit with a colleague and have a private discussion, or you could simply look at the town which you represent. And one very charming characteristic of this building is that it's completely open to the public. And these babies, these lovely children, walked across when our photographer was photographing the, the building. And we, when we were designing the town hall here, there was a, an attack on a town hall in, in Flanders. And we said to them that we had designed the British embassy in Poland and that we could make a, a very discreet security system to, to stop people coming to the building. And they said, no, it belongs to the people of Dainsa, which was a very wonderful thing. And the council chamber. Well, the council chamber can look out to the city and the city can see the politicians. And this is one of the reasons that we won the competition. In Europe now, and especially in um, the lowlands, there's a real um, desire for actual transparency where politicians and the people that they represent see each other, are part of the community. And Dines has a, a wonderful mayor um, who's really passionate about his city. It's, it's very, very interesting to see how all this works. And we were extremely happy to be part of it and to represent democracy in our building. Another project in Antwerp that we made was part of a development of six towers. You should see three here, but further off the page, there's, there's this, well, there's this building by David Chipperfield, and then another one by David, and two buildings by the Swiss architect Roger Dino. And um, the story is very funny about this because the development was originally being made by a very sophisticated um, Antwerp developer. And in the middle of the project, he had to sell it. So the point that he sold it was here. And I, I haven't got photographs of it, but so David had a rather sophisticated building with balconies on all sides. And then the site was, the project was bought by a much tougher um, Dutch um, developer who um, wasn't going to spend any money. And um, sorry, I have some. And so we, David lost his balconies and the budget dropped. The budget dropped like this for David to his. So he, he lost all of his balconies. And then for us, it dropped um, again. And we said, um, yeah. um, we said, uh, well, we went to visit the developer, the new developer, and they said, um, um, sorry, I, I, background noise, I'm going to turn my, um, right, here we go. Um, we said, they said, what would you like to build your buildings from? And we said, white concrete, like David Chipperfield. And they said, well, you can't. It's too expensive. So we said, what should we build the buildings from? And they said, brick. That's what we do in Flanders. And so we had to make some elegant buildings using brick. And we, this is what we did. We, we made one tower. Well, 
Essentially, we made two towers, two brick towers with slightly different forms. And we made one have a vertical emphasis and another have a horizontal emphasis. And we, we left the corners out so that the profile of the building was strong. You can see it here. And we lit the balconies, not from the ceiling, but actually from underneath the balcony so that when you look up, you see a lit surface. So the composition of the facade changes according to who's home and who's got light on. So it fluctuates, it fluctuates according to life. And then on the top, um, we made a, a light. This is at the furthest point of the key and we, we lit the top. And it's brickwork like this. We, um, it stops here in case people climb up it. And the, there was beautiful landscaping by a French landscape designer whose name, I'm sorry to say, I can't remember, but so it has tremendous harmony. And, and there's two different types of brick in there. The horizontal brick is, is a different color, slightly different color. And the question in my mind was, how could two towers in what is quite a remote place without much, without the physical context of a, a built city, how could it respond to its context? And unconsciously, it does. I think in color, it does. And in form, there are relationships, at least I see. And then here, it has a, a rather more awkward relationship with David's tower. And in relation to the boats, it has the kind of height and the length of a boat. And then the balconies. So what can a balcony give you to make you feel part of a neighborhood? Well, the balcony first of all, lets you feel that you're part of the building. So when you stand on the balcony, you can touch this stuff. You can put your hand around and feel the building you're in. But it also lets you see all of this. And this dockyard is, will change over the next 20 years. It will become, it'll have more towers, more housing. It will stop being industrial and it will become more habitable. And all of that you will witness, you will see from your balcony. In Ghent, also in Belgium, we made a project of 200 apartments, starting with this building, which is from the 1950s. And it was originally a motor garage. And it's rather beautiful. It, it, the brickwork is... Um, ceramic has a ceramic surface and the concrete work is very very fine it has these tiny window frames and concrete and it's preserved you can't knock it down so we built on top of it and next to it and this is it turns around the corner and then it stopped there wasn't any facade here so the developer bought it and the land and we made two very large villa apartment blocks separated from the existing building and from each other by a garden. You can see that here. So there's a, a glass screen in front of it, partly because this road is quite noisy, but also in a way to give it definition and specialness. This street doesn't, you couldn't animate it with um, commerce a little bit. You had to do something much stronger. And these um, gardens do that. And they have lines of sight right across the neighborhood. So they, unlike most of our developments, they actually are, make a major contribution to the quality of that place that they're in. 
and at the level of um, the street, they are exciting. They're exciting to be near. <coughs> and it's a system of courtyards inside with um, stucco facades, rendered facades and windows. This, this is consciously, many cities are made like this. Vienna is made like this, or parts of Paris are made like this. We were fascinated by the simplicity of um, balconies and windows. And you can see that screen there. And then there are moments where your apartment touches the, um, the glass. So the moments of drama, which are come out of the facts of the project. And then depending on which way the, the apartment faces, there are balconies and then sometimes there are just windows. And because it's away from the street and quiet, you can have ground floor apartments, which anyway in the lowlands are, are quite uh, accepted. And then here's the facade of the existing building preserved and propped up. And so it forms a side to the courtyard. There's no glass in here, but it's, it just, it's a, a, a way of giving peace to the space. And again, like the screen on the front where it touches the new buildings we did, there's a kind of drama. And here's what it looks like from the street, from the back street. And sometimes the apartments touch that facade and they have a garden, a strange garden, which is open to the air above, but covered. So when it rains, you can sit outside in the rain and the window opens up behind the original concrete window frame. And you can see how delicate the original work was. And then at the other end of the building, we, were, we made this new building in the same brick as in the, in the garage, rather plain um, and connected to the building by a, a sort of recess. Um, I'll show you now a competition that we made for Swiss radio and television in Zurich, a competition which we didn't win, but in fact, the project was canceled. But it was a small building in a huge campus of lots of different buildings. And the purpose of this building was to be the public entry to Swiss radio and television, because as a public body, it had a duty to welcome the public inside it. So the public can come and have lunch there. They can see news programs being made. There would be events for them. And then above are floors and floors and floors of journalists. And then on the top floor, the computer system and the, um, the information disks. And that building would be connected at first floor level by a bridge, which would go back through all of the buildings so that if you wanted to come for lunch, when you came for lunch, you would go through this route undercover. And there was, in this first floor, was an enormous canteen. So here's a view from above, looking at the, the place where the public enter. And there's a news theater, a ramped news theater, where you can watch the news and above there is the place where the news is, is broadcast. So when you walk in, you can see the newsreader, and then you see what it's like on TV. And then here is the cafe or the restaurant for the whole of the group of buildings. But the surprise is that at the back of the building, it's not a big square at all. It has this big cart and a garden at ground floor level, a garden at first floor level, and I'll show you what it looks like inside. So these spaces for journalists all 
are grouped around this garden in the middle. So they can see each other, they can see their friends. Now, in journalism or um, TV journalism, um, groups of people are constantly being reformed, furniture is being moved. So we made a system or we, there is a system that we used where you light upward from the ceiling and down on the desk, which means you have very minimal amounts of light in the ceiling. And one of my uh, obsessions, I would say, in London is that when you walk along the streets and look up into new office buildings, what you see in the evening is a horrible array of cheap lighting. And that's something I definitely didn't want to do here. So here's the plan. These are one, two, three areas of work with private offices on the edges. Um, and the most important part is this element here, which on every floor was an only lightly heated space, a sort of greenhouse with a glass floor, glass block floor. And that was a bistro, a place where you took coffee or met casually, or you could sit working um, looking out with your laptop. And it meant that everybody here would meet there. So it was a, a sort of socializing facility. And then on the floor below, the first floor, this is the bridge that I mentioned that comes from different directions from the rest of the campus. And there would be a cafe here. So let's say you wanted to meet someone, you'd say, let's meet in the cafe opposite the newsroom. And then the restaurant was arranged around here. There was a private dining space here, um, a different kind of eating there. And one of the, um, one of the things that, that it's not satisfactory to see is, is a huge canteen that's empty. It's just very depressing. So here we planned that you would be able to close it off and here, so you would reduce the amount of visible seating to a small amount. And then on the, on the ground floor, this is where the public came in. The public and the broadcasters and the presenters all came from the same entrance and the presenters went through a security barrier there. And then this was a public cafe and restaurant. Um, and there's the new theater there. So it was a very exciting program. And this final drawing, this plan shows the spirit of the place as a workplace. So a garden in the middle, the um, winter garden where you meet as a bistro, and then these three lofts, you might say, around them. In Switzerland, at this moment, we're constructing an apartment building in Neuhausen am Rheinfall, which is some way away from Zurich. And it's, as the name will tell you, its, its fame is based upon this extraordinary waterfall. So it's a, on the one hand, it's a modest, small community. On the other hand, it's a tourist destination. And the developer that we are working with bought this site which overlooks the waterfall. This doesn't exist anymore, it's all been torn down. And it's, it's a very, very typical Swiss cities where you get um, apartments to live in, small shops, and then a factory. And in fact, this um, area will be called industry plats. And so when we won this competition, we said that we would make a, an apartment building here, which had different facets to it, which spoke this kind of language. And there would be a high point here and then a lower point there, so that, I'll just go back, so that this building here would still have a view to industry plats and would get south light on its balconies. So it looks like this, and it's being built now. And so there's a group of apartments that look over the waterfall. 
and then this group of apartments look over the plats. And then this is a tiny two-story building of um, houses with their own balconies, with their own identity facing the street. Um, originally, the idea was that these would be at the same scale as the, the buildings that existed there. And then about a month after we designed it, we discovered that a 20-story building was about to be built here. So our idea of contextuality was blown up. But this, this is the balcony that would look over industry plats. And you can see that the factories are, are very dignified, they're very good buildings. And then looking over the um, waterfall, which is below here, to the mountains, these apartments would be really beautiful. And coming close to the end here, another project in the lowlands, but in Holland this time, in Den Helder in the north of the Netherlands, a project we worked on with another architect, the Dutch architect who built these, and then we built um, in between them. And they were modest middle-class housing. And this is our attempt to um, do the best thing that Dutch architecture does. Good brick, a little bit of stone, a good shape on the roof, large windows. So there's a, a variety of different finishes, sometimes painted, sometimes brick. And then over here is a, a big canal that looks out to a um, Napoleonic dockyard. And at the back, there's a smaller canal. This is Holland, where there are canals everywhere. So we'll look now at the other side. So at the back, there's much smaller houses, um, which are um, for small families, older people, re retirement, single people who want to work from home. And then between those two rows of houses, it captures the view of the existing city. So it, it's reminiscent of the buildings in uh, Den Helder, but it's from these times. And a strange project, we, we were commissioned and completed this building for a, a restaurant in front of the Tower of London to replace, replace a building that existed. And the, what do you make? What do you do with a building in front of a building like this? Well, you can either do what the entrance to the Tower of London does, which is a high-tech building that says, I've got nothing to do with the Tower of London. Or you can build innocent little wooden huts, which are where the food is served, things like hamburgers. But I wanted to make a building which related to this. So this is natural stone. And our building is wood, but very lightly painted with white stain. And then this figure, is one of these upside down. So it sort of rhymes with um, the Tower of London. It has three parts. It has, um, well, it has four parts, in fact. I'll just go back. It has a part that's actually under Tower Bridge. And then this low part, the tall part, and that's all one space. And then here it has an outdoor garden with a framework where when it's raining, you can make blinds come down so you can eat outside in the rain. And it's, um, there's a, in English it's called a moat around the Tower of London, there's a moat. So this sits right on the edge of the moat and, and it's, a, it's not just a tourist restaurant, it's a restaurant for business people. And it lets you sit and look at Tower Bridge, there isn't anywhere else in the vicinity where you can sit and appreciate the weird ugliness of Victorian British architecture. I mean, the Tower of London is a pretty horrific building and you get a full view of it here. But this metalwork here talks to the metalwork on the Tower Bridge. This is unconscious, but it happens. And this metalwork 
but it gives you lighting in the evening. And as I say, you can pull blinds down in the rain or in the sun. But it, it rhymes. This rhymes with that. And the final project is house. We Well, it's, is it a house? It's a, a long interior that we made for Anish Kapoor, the British sculptor. And it's underneath an apartment building, which I'm not going to show you, but it's... In London, to get a site for a house is very, very difficult. And so Anish brought a long background to um, this apartment building, which originally had been a workshop. And so the, the stairs to the apartment building are here, and the entrance to Anish's house is here, and that's the garage. So you come in, and there's a long corridor. And one of the issues here, one of the conditions was that we couldn't, we had no windows in the side walls. So there were often long periods where there was no light only coming, there was only light coming from one end. So here we, we put a electric lighting recess, which lit the space. And we also used reflective materials, stone, lacquer, stainless steel. So the little bit of light that you have is reflected and, and sustained. And then it's rather difficult to see, but here there's a courtyard in a star shape and we're looking back and that it's made even more complicated by the fact that there's a sculptor, sculpture by Dan Graham in it, which looks like a courtyard. And then proceeding further, you go into the living room and here's a stair that takes you up to the bedrooms, but we'll come back to that. So you go into the living room, you go into the living room and then that's the stair. There's a stone self-supporting stair. And that's the other side. That's an Anish Kapoor sculpture. And then in the roof here, there's, there's a courtyard above here, an open courtyard with a glass floor that brings light in here. So at every opportunity, we got light from wherever we could. And then proceeding along, there's a garden. And by the side of it is a corridor with books in it. And that corridor, you go up some steps and it brings you to the bedroom. And underneath the bedroom are windows to a bathroom that I'll show you in a minute. But you come into the bedroom and the bedroom's high, it's like a pavilion overlooking a garden. And this is the parents' bedroom. And the children's bedrooms are in the house on the first floor. So it's a delight, really. The garden is very, very wild now. And then in the corner of the, the um, bedroom is a stair that takes you down to the bathroom and it has a, a roof line above it. And then you go down, and this is the window I showed you looking onto the garden. And you're under the garden in the bathroom. That's the kind of gymnastics you have to exercise when you make a house in London. But if we go back and we go to this staircase and go upstairs, then you land and you can begin to see that this floor is it's made of glass and it extends out to this courtyard on the roof um, and then it's modest it does have one facade which is at the rear in a tiny cul-de-sac and this is the building so it's a sort of magic place where you only would ever see it if you get invited in but a lot of cities are like that they're made by um, places you can see places you you can only uh, understand by looking into them and then places you might never visit or visit once in a lifetime so thank you that's my lecture and if you have any questions I'm happy to answer them I can't hear a thing. Hi, Tony. Thank you. 
<laughs> Great. I hope I made sense. You never can tell. Uh, wenn jemand Fragen hat, dann müsst man in the in den Computer reinlegen. Yeah, I Und have a question. Uh, you did a lot of projects for art and artists. Is this a special, uh, is a special work to work together with artists? On the other hand, uh, with the work of artists for museums and gallery spaces? Well, we don't get many art spaces now. The art world is very fashionable, you know. So um, artists and museums have become prisoners of the neoliberalist capitalist system. And um, so we, we very occasionally get art projects, but, but in Belgium and in England, in fact, we're making parts of the city, we're making housing as a, a, an element of continuity in the city. So we don't get as many art galleries as we'd like. All the people I taught as students get the art goes and we don't get any. <laughs> That's life. So, but full saying was good. We won it in competition. That was, and they were wonderful clients. And it's, it's, it's 13 years now since we, since it was um, conceived and it's had a, an impact on the region. The region of Fulsang was very poor. It didn't have any industry. And that museum has actually encouraged uh, departments from Danish universities to move there. So that makes me happier in a way. Art is great, but society is greater. How many people are working now in your office? I don't know. I, I, we had to fire half the office, so I can't even, I'm too sad to say. We, um, with Corona, we had to let everybody go. So, but it's, I've, yeah, it's not, a, it's not great, but we're rebuilding, we're rebuilding the office, but it's, that's not been easy. Have you got any more difficult questions, Anna? Like, um, how much money don't we make or, um, What's it like being an architect in England after Brexit or uh, any other difficult questions? I'm optimistic. I guess you have to be. I think there are no really questions. And on the other hand, uh, today it's the opening of the exhibition where you a member of the exhibition Which I can't, go to, I can't go to the opening of my exhibition, but there are other people who are in the exhibition. So I shall have dinner instead. That's what I'll do. Good. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope it made sense to you. And um, perhaps in the future, I'll actually come to Innsbruck and you can see me in the flesh. I do hope to come when the exhibition opens, because friends of mine are in the exhibition too. So that would be good. Okay, Tony, thank you very much for the okay. lecture. See you in lifetime. <laughs> nice. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Das muss ich da jetzt machen.